so much for coming. Uh, Mischief and Mayhem uh, wants to start a publishing revolution. Uh, and so we've invited a number of visionaries here with us tonight to help us figure out how to do it. Um, tomorrow, uh, Mr. Van Mayhem is going to accuse uh, corporate publishers of censorship. Um, but tonight, I'm going to play devil's advocate. We didn't invite any corporate publishers this evening, um, which was a mistake, because we don't have anyone to argue with. So if I could ask you to just use your imagination, I am wearing pinstripes. And I've got a tie. Um, so I am now the man. <laughs> OK? Um, it's a one-time only occasion, I think. Um, and uh, I am the CEO of a major uh, corporate publishing house. And I've got a private car that drives me around places. And I'm power tripping. And uh, i got a big house maybe somewhere, a country house and a duplex on Gramercy Park. Um, and these are my enemies. <laughs> um, because I think they want to put me out of business. Um, enemies uh, of corporate publishing, could I ask you to introduce yourselves? Starting? Should I start? Yes. OK. Um, should I speak a lot or not too much? Or should I use two words? Or <laughs> Whatever I need to know so okay. that I know what kind of entity you are and how much I have to fear from okay. you. <laughs> well, I, um, uh, I am Jack. My parents, um, um, actually, they um, left Czechoslovakia when I was 16 um, and uh, because it was a communist state. And they came to the States, okay, through India, because it was illegal to leave the country. And so I studied in the States, and after that I went back to Europe. And um, I went to Barcelona, which I liked very much, so I just stayed there. And uh, I started translating. I started translating from Czech to Spanish mm -hmm. and to Catalan. So I translated uh, like a, a lot from Czech literature, almost I would say like all the classics and the, the alive classics like Kundera and Raval and Hasek and so you name them. And um, uh, I also translated some poetry and other things from Russian. Um, and then when I have translated about, I don't know, more than 50 books, I thought it was kind of enough. Well, I'm still going on with the translation, but I thought that maybe I should do something else. And I started writing. First of all, I wrote um, a biography of one of the authors I was translating, Bohumil Harabal. And then um, after that, I started writing my own things. I kind of like writing, so I started writing my own novels, short stories, and all kinds of things. And well, um, I have, uh, um, I would say, like from, uh, okay. Uh, I always read classics, Catherine Mansfield, Chekhov. These are my the examples that you know I I like to follow. I like to read always. I read them almost like once a year, and um, so I what I try to do. I try to do literature. I want my every book to be a little bit different from the other one. I try to challenge my myself. You know. I'm more inter interested in doing a, a good book uh, so that I would be happy mm -hmm. and my friends who are very demanding so that they would be happy with the books rather than thinking only about the sales, although the question uh, Monica, is there. Monica. But I'm, we are You're not on my about side. You're not on my side. I know. I knew that. That's, That's all why I needed I said to it. hear. Yeah. OK. <laughs> Carmen, uh, if you could. Uh, Tell us a little bit briefly about your work. I can, and I think I'm going to do an exception with you just for this question, because you are not in my universe. It's true. I was raised as an author in Mexico City. My name is Carmen Bullosa. My first books were published by very independent uh, houses, to say so houses. One was the living room of a writer that discovered uh, older than us, like. 20 years older than us, and he discovered there was a new generation appearing around, and he started uh, making his own enterprise. He didn't take the books to 
bookstores nor traded them anyway. They, he gave them away to the authors and the authors sent them by mail. It was a completely independent operation. Uh, simultaneously, I published my other first book of poetry, because I called them both my first book, in a handprint house, uh, uh, Taller Martín Pescador. Uh, the editor and printer, Juan Pasco, also discovered there was a new generation. He's, uh, you might know who is Roberto Bolaño. He's the first uh, publisher of Roberto Bolaño, an editor. And with him, he discovered all the generation that, the generation that was uh, in that moment growing in Mexico City. He printed only 160 copies, hand printed beautiful books, and he sold them in parties that were almost more beautiful than the books. Wonderful parties. He made his own liquor, by the way. Uh, and uh, we cooked and we danced, and of course Octavio Paz was there. The big writers of Mexico also started publishing with him because he had very good taste. The books were marvelous, and that was that was a world that I really loved. This world of the independent publishers, and uh, I remember when I took my one of my two first books, the hand-printed book, to Octavio Paz and showed it to him. He said, um, "Are you going to stay with him forever as your publisher? He's the publisher to have when you are a poet." And I said, "No, I want more readers." And Octavio Paz said. No, I don't have more readers in Mexico. That, that's in 1978. I don't have more readers in Mexico. That's the amount of copies I sell of my books. He later got the Nobel Prize and started selling a little bit more, not <laughs> much more. Uh, and well, later on, I started also writing novels, and uh, I was badly in need of money, and I went with one of your people. Uh, they printed the book horribly. They saw wrong the author, they said a woman author of the generation where there are some women authors, bestsellers of Mexico, they thought he could, thought he could sell my book, it was a disaster. So I returned again to a literary press where I continued and well, more or less my life has been marginal from you with some exceptions. That first one because I needed money and later I was also tempted by Alfaguara that owns El País and it's a corporate. I did three books with them. They were very respectful, very nice, but I, for my next novel, I didn't feel comfortable with them. I, I wasn't sure that was a house surrounded by the authors I wanted and the readers I wanted. Because readers look for the authors, they, they, they smell the authors, and they smell who wants to do real books, the kind of reader that I write for, yes, literary yes, readers. Sir. <laughs> Thank you, but uh, yeah, okay. Uh, ben, how about you? You might have some uh, have some hope for me. I think you you publish with large <laughs> and small publishers, if I'm not mistaken. Y yeah, I mean, I I prefer to tell my own story, corporate oh, publisher. I see. <coughs> <laughs> um, I'm uh, Ben Greenman, and I, I uh, I'll start with my day job because it, it has something to do with the way that I published. I, I'm an editor at, at the New Yorker uh, magazine. And because I have a day job, and I've always sort of worked in journalism, I've been a reporter or an editor, um, publishing when it happened, at least initially, was always something that I did because I found the right relationship with the publisher rather than needing money. Not that I hate money, we'll get to that in a second, but it wasn't the primary motivator. So in 2001, I published my first book with uh, Brooklyn Independent, at the time publisher uh, McSweeney's, and then proceeded to work with a number of independent publishers, mostly in Brooklyn. Uh, Soft Skull, uh, McAdam Cage, which is out in San Francisco, Akashic, a very, very small publisher called Hotel St. George uh, that did art books. They, I can describe it later, but they did a beautiful folding book box thing for me. And then Melville House. Um, it did one book with each of those publishers. And I think my motives were maybe a little different in that I wanted to work with as many independents as possible so I could figure out publishing. I, th I think I had in the back of my mind that one day I might do some version of that myself. That hasn't happened yet. But at each stop along the way there were interesting things about the challenges that they faced in distribution or working with a big distributor but facing challenges paying authors on the back end or whatever. They, each of them great experiences but each in their own way sort of di distinct. Um, yes, at some point uh, evil corporate publisher, I then as a result of this book box that I did with this publishing house called Hotel St. George, 
HarperCollins, one of the evil publishing giants, came to me, and they effectively wanted to do the paperback version of this weird book that was never really a hardback, but this, this box. And uh, I had been suspicious of corporate publishing for a variety of reasons. Most of my friends who are writers all had some problems. Some of them were sort of rich people problems, I suppose, that they, they didn't like the cover art that they were given, or they deadlines closed up on them. They weren't always sort of serious problems with, with you know corporate agenda, but they were frustrated by it, and they were things that I hadn't experienced working with independent publishers, where there was a lot more engagement and communication along the way. Uh, though I should say that going to HarperCollins, and I published two books with them, and I have a third coming, has been a pleasant surprise. I, I, I don't know how this fits into your role playing or the fake evil you or the other you, but I, I haven't faced some of the things that I thought I would. Uh, some of them have happened, but not to me, I've heard of them, but generally it's changed a little bit the way I think of this uh, good evil division, but it, you know, it has a certain shape. It's a different kind of publishing. And so there's hope for you. Yeah, I can't, I can't even look at you when I'm talking about this. You make me so angry with your corporate ways. But um, <laughs> hope, yeah, I mean, I think that it's, yes, we can talk more about it later, but it's a question of the level of liberty that you're able to achieve in publishing and then what the, uh, uh, what the byproducts of that are, I guess, is what I would say more later. Mikola, a little bit about your background? Uh, well, uh, my name is Mikola uh, Repchuk. Uh, the name is very complicated, so, so I, I wouldn't bother you with my surname anymore, but the name is uh, Mikola, which, is, which has some analogs in all European languages. It's something like Nicholas. Uh, it comes from uh, Greek goddess of victory, Nika. Uh, I'm from a very remote country, which is uh, defined in different sources, like uh, Far East uh, Europe or uh, Western Eurasia. It's called Ukraine. And uh, maybe I'm a writer, I'm not sure, it's only God knows whether was, uh, who is right or who is not. Typically I define myself as a journalist or maybe a scribbler. Uh, I'm a man of a letter. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm your uh, ally uh, because um, basically I don't, I don't care about all these problems. I solved them long ago uh, back in the Soviet Union uh, when um, I published my first books absolutely independently because it was kind of some without or some is that. It was absolutely underground publishing and it was uh, carried out in a very amateurish way uh, just by a typewriting machine and we used for these purposes uh, very thin paper like cigarette, you know, very thin paper. Ten copies could be printed uh, uh, one at the same time and it was distributed uh, by just fans and also uh, and of course uh, also um, it was recorded uh, because we had some uh, illegal meetings as it was reported by KGB and we read our texts and it was recorded and these records also were uh, distributed by uh, uh, followers so to say. Uh, so um, I, b I believe that uh, the most important is a good text uh, ancient uh, Greek literature didn't have any publishers at all, but they produced very good literature, uh, as, as well as uh, Romans. Uh, so um, I was happy to have a, a good, very good review back in 1978 in a local Komsomol paper, a uh, review of my unpublished short story which was distributed only underground. Nonetheless, they uh, got them somewhere from KGB and it was absolutely crashing uh, review uh, written from the Communist Party, from KGB position. So I, I expected after that imprisonment, but luckily it didn't happen. I was just expelled from the university. But, uh, but you know, I believe that good texts could, could, even if they are unpublished, they could be uh, advertised and even reviewed by, uh, by some uh, professional uh, Critics. Thank you. Amy, you're a publisher. Um, are you on my side? <laughs> what, what's, what's your deal? Well, my deal is I'm the uh, editorial director of the Feminist Press. My name's Amy Shoulder. And um, uh, I've been there for two and a half years. This is a press that's been around for 40 years as an independent publisher and has a history of, of, uh, that's, that's worked. 
basically as an independent nonprofit publisher of bringing out books. Um, previously, it had been about bringing out books by women um, from around the world. And since I've been there for the last two and a half years, I've tried to bring it more into the 20th, 21st century and, and think about new ways that feminism can be defined and, and really publish books that, that um, will appeal to a wider and um, um, simply progressive audience. Um, so I'm publishing books um, by Justin Vivian Bond, who's a trans performer that's coming out next fall. I am just published a book by Karen Finley. I've published a book by Rana Reiko Rizzuto called Hiroshima in the Morning recently. Um, so previous to this position, I was the um, editor-in-chief at a very fine independent publisher, uh, Seven Stories Press. and. Um, there I published books by Elfrida Jelinek and Coco Fusco and uh, Ani DeFranco. Um, and then before that I was at, uh, I was the U.S. publisher of Verso, which is a, a non-fiction um, publisher of kind of radical, progressive books, uh, intellectual books. Um, that uh, there I published a book, uh, I published Laura Flanders' first book and a book by Judith Butler um, and many more. And previous to that, I was, um, I co-founded co and was the editor of an imprint called High Risk Books that was um, an imprint of an English publisher, Serpent's Tale. And that was in the 90s, at a time when there was a lot of interest in, um, in, um, in writing that was somehow outside of dominant culture and was responding to the culture wars here in the US. And we published um, Sapphire's first book, American Dreams, books by June Jordan, Gary Indiana, um, Kathy Acker, Lynn Tillman, and um, we I don't, don't travel in the same circles. <laughs> <laughs> but interestingly, we publish some of the same authors. We'll get to that later. Dale? Uh, my name is Dale Peck. I, I used to think I was Lisa Deerbeck's friend because we're co founders of the Mischief and Mayhem. Uh, publishing company, but I, I didn't realize there was this other side to her that's it's really alienated me, and I'm very glad I'm far away from her because I might do something violent, I'm not sure. Um, uh, I um, uh, am mostly a writer, however, um, and I have I, a fairly long and involved um, uh, relationship with, with the companies that, that that person at the other end of the um, panel represents. I published my first book with Forrest Strauss and Drew when it was still an independent company. Um, and by the time I got to my third book, they had been purchased by the Von Holtzbring Group. Um, uh, and it seemed to me that the more Von Holtzbring got involved in FSG, the more my relationship with them deteriorated, the more I was told things like my books needed to be happier, or they needed to be shorter, not because the narratives were too long, but because paper was expensive, uh, or that it was a very good idea to put naked women on the covers of, of them because it might sell more copies. Um, uh, I left FSG for William Morrow when it was also an independent company. Um, uh, and before the first book could come out that I sold to William Morrow, it was purchased by HarperCollins, which um, uh, I'm glad that Ben had a great relationship with them, but I had a terrible relationship with them, uh, and in fact um, ended up not letting them publish my book. Um, uh, and uh, then went from there, sold the same book actually um, uh, to Carolyn Graff, which is a very small independent company, only to have it be bought um, also by a very large concern, <laughs> in this case, Perseus Avalon. Um, uh, and as with the imprint of William Morrow that I was a part of, uh, Carolyn Graff was also dissolved. Um, and once again, I pulled a book from them rather than let them publish a book without any staff with which to publish it. Um, and along about that time, I sort of got tired of you know uh, having all these relationships with evil corporate publishing go south. So I thought it would be a good uh, idea to start a company myself. And uh, um, one of the things that Lisa didn't mention was that the first book that we published was hers, and the next book we're publishing is mine. Um, <laughs> so uh, you know, uh, we obviously have a, a, all kinds of vested interest in it. But, um, I, I'm still not convinced that Lisa you know really likes this evil corporate empire that she's representing. So I'm waiting for her to convince me. 
Dale, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> You've published 10 books, all with mainstream publishers. Your career depends... No, no, one, one, was, one was with New Press. Oh, excuse me, nine, nine books. Nine books, all with mainstream publishers. Your career depends on the book industry. Do you want it to collapse? Uh, desperately, fervently, uh, yes. Uh, I, I really do want the book industry to collapse. If, if by book industry you mean these sort of large, you know, corporate entities um, that I do. are I do mean so that. Uh, bloated with, um, you know, external staff that are so hamstrung by the world's most ridiculous, ridiculous sales model in which they give away 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of the book's cover price. Um, beef, and that's you know, and try to use the remaining ten percent to pay for their high-rise buildings and their massive staffs. Um, and somewhere way down the line, the author. Um, if you mean you know booksellers that are interested in selling the most numbers of copies of the fewest numbers of books, um, uh, that chart or or internet portals that charge. 50, 60, 70 percent um, uh, of, of, of a book's retail price solely for the sake of providing a link to it, then yes, I, 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 I don't see any reason for any of that to continue anymore when, um, as we've shown with Mischief and Mayhem, uh, you know, it's pretty easy to sell a book directly to the consumer um, uh, and, and cut out all of those evil people. Authors defect from corporate publishing is the title of this panel. I don't like the sound of that. But the truth is, the opposite happens. Amy, authors start out with you, an independent press, and then defect to commercial houses, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. You and I have published some of the same authors. Uh -huh. I'm big and powerful. What can you do that I can? Well, you know, I've been thinking about this Lisa, since we spoke on the phone, and and I, you know, I have two stories that give you two very different answers. Uh, one of them, for instance, I published um, I published last September a book called Hiroshima in the Morning by Rana Reiko Rizuto. It's a beautiful memoir that uh, ended up as a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award, and which. Um, we did very well with. So this is a book that that uh, that so Rana had uh, Reiko had published a book with Harper Collins many years ago. This was her second book. It took her a long time to write. It's this gorgeous book. She has a high powered agent. It went around. Uh, it has something to do with 9/11 um, and at the time that her agent sent it around to a lot of of good literary corporate publishers. Um, they felt there was a, um, you know, 9-11 burnout. Nobody wanted to do it. It's a beautiful book, but she got a big stack of very pleasant rejection letters, and nobody wanted to do it. And then I met Reiko um, and um, found her instantly compelling, found out she had a manuscript in her drawer that had been sitting there for six months. And so one thing led to another, and the feminist press published it, and we had it become, you know, it became a finalist for a, you know, a very, uh, I think, important uh, award, national award, and then uh, it had a really great uh, media frenzy around it that went from this award uh, nomination to The View and Gail King and. We sold a lot of copies of this book, and there was a part of me that felt like, well, I can do what, what maybe a corporate publisher would not have done, which was really pay attention to this book. Uh, it didn't get that kind of review coverage when it first went out um, in September of 2010, but we kept working on it. We tried all different kinds of angles, and something finally worked, and it did really well. And it has a beautiful package, and I feel like that's that's the success story. Um, but to, to make a short story long, um, you know, I published <laughs> Sapphire's first book in um, a long time ago um, called American <laughs> Dreams. And, uh, and it was a beautiful little book of poems and short stories. And from that success, um, she was able to um, 
get an agent who believed in her and took that book around to corporate publishers, to editors of, of literary books in corporate houses, and and she, uh, you know, was was selling her next book, which was um, Push, which some of you may know from the movie Precious. Um, but um, but this little novel was brilliant. Did she have a bunch of editors first say to her from corporate houses, you know, look, it would be a lot better if you know at the end of the book this obese African American woman, if she slimmed down, if something good happened to her. Um, <laughs> It would be a lot easier for us to sell this. You know, did that happen? Yes. Uh, did she agree to those to those kinds of requests? No. And eventually, she found a corporate, an editor at a corporate house who loved the book the way it was, and it was published. And uh, she made six figures from that book. It it launched a literary career that now is leading to a new book that's coming out from um, Penguin this summer. And that she, um, uh, you know, not only has been very, very well compensated for, but you know, I think she um, is being read widely and appreciated. Now, if I, you know, if, if that manuscript, if Push had gone around and round and no one had wanted to publish it the way it was and came back to me, would I have published it? Absolutely. Would I have, you know, if I sat up here and talked about her as being you know, what I think is one of the best writers of, of her generation, depicting something in American culture no one else has, would other people, would I feel like other people necessarily agree with that or know who I'm talking about? Maybe, you know, but I'm not sure. And am I happy for her and when other authors go on to have a kind of success like that? You know, absolutely. So um, I think I have a complicated relationship to that question even. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's really, you know, my relationship to my authors is, is primary to me. And then there's the kind of business of books after that. Well, some authors on this panel, and, and certainly at Mischief and Mayhem, uh, have accused corporate publishers of taking editing to such an extreme degree that it's become a form of censorship. Um, ben, would you agree that novels are being sanitized by publishers today, as Mischief and Mayhem claims, or are the writers to blame? I think in, uh, in my experience, I can only speak for myself and then I'm happy to speak for others irresponsibly, but real realistically only for myself. I, I think. I think there is certainly self-censorship. I mean, this speaks to the point about Push. If she had taken it to a publisher who said, we will publish this and give it the kind of rollout that you want if you make these changes, and she chose to do that rather than stick by the original version, that's self-censorship, and I guarantee that happens all the time. People make all kinds of bargains. The, the other interesting thing, though, is that we, I think it's a, a little bit of a false dichotomy to talk about uh, corporate publishing is one kind of publishing exclusively. The difference is that corporate publishing has a lot of different kinds of publishing underneath it, whereas smaller houses can be more uh, focused in their, in their aims, I suppose. They can do one thing really well, or two things really well. With that said, there, there are smaller publishers, um, bigger smaller publishers, but they that publish books that go on to be huge uh, commercial sellers, and they change the face of those Publishers. This is a, getting a little bit away from your question, but I think it changes authors' perceptions. Uh, Time Traveler's Wife was published by McAdam Cage originally. Like Water for Elephants was uh, an Algonquin book. And so they have to kind of uh, reassess what, what their goals are, how much of their business they give over to trying to court books like that. We could talk at, at much great, in much greater detail about where the money goes. If a publisher makes a lot of money unexpectedly off of a book, uh, sometimes they acquire a lot of books quickly that they're sort of not... I can think of at least one case that I know of where, where I felt like they weren't prepared to make all these acquisitions. They, they, in very good faith, with the best of intentions, went out with their new money that they didn't expect to have and acquired a lot of books that they weren't able to publish as responsibly and as sort of uh, intimately as they were accustomed to before and it hurt some of the books, and it hurt some of the relationships, and, and it's it simply a, I, I suppose, a misjudgment. Um, 
back to the original question, I uh, censoring no, but I think that publishing always is a market at any level, if it's publishing, if you're going to give it to somebody who's going to make more than one copy of it. To some degree it's market driven. I would say in my experience it's much more uh, self-censorship if that's the word, meaning that you, you try to change the proposal or the manuscript, you know, people that I know, to be more palatable to a larger publisher because you perceive that there are certain kinds of rewards coming from there. Th Dale's explained how he uh, refused to do that and, and I know plenty of authors who do that too and they find either a good independent or in some cases a good corporate publisher. I do think that it's suspicious that every independent house Dale went to uh, became corporate shortly after and I would suggest maybe he's a sleeper agent. Because I, I don't think there's any other explanation. It's all within six months to a year. So I'd look into that if I were you. Thanks. Monica, you've written about a writer who commits suicide. Did a publisher drive him to it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Publishers like you. <laughs> was, was this story based on an actual event? Um, no, this was, this was true. This is a true story, okay? There was a writer, um, Czech writer, uh, who was, um, who, um, he was from Prague, okay? And um, he, w he wrote, um, um, let's say, experimental prose. Mm, and so he couldn't publish it um, in those years in the communist Czechoslo uh, Czechoslovakia, right? Because um, only or mainly, uh, mainly um, um, socialist realism was accepted. So he wasn't accepted by any publisher, but his uh, literary friends could read his, his books, okay? His manuscripts, um, they would just circulate among people, okay, among, in the literary circles. But still, well, after the 68, after the, the Russian, the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia, he left the country like many others, many other intellectuals and other people. And um, he went to, to Switzerland, to live to Switzerland, and he thought, well, here I'll be able to publish. Uh, and uh, here I will find a publisher and a public, and uh, people uh, for sure will be curious uh, to read my, um, uh, my, my books because he was very highly uh, regarded by, by the literary circles in Prague. Um, so what happened? He took his work to different publishers and nobody wanted it. Nobody wanted it. There was once only one who published it. He hardly sold anything. So he didn't publish any more books by him. And uh, uh, while in Prague, at least he was followed by his fellow literary man, right? N not so in Western Europe. So he felt lonely, abandoned by everybody, and um, he really committed suicide. So this is like a very, really terrible example what uh, what can happen to, to a person by people like you. <laughs> <laughs> Nicola, um, your dissident poetry also found an audience. Um, how? Well, it was, it was normal at the time. Uh, poetry and short stories could be uh, distributed uh, underground <coughs> in this uh, tape, tape written copy. Uh, they circulated in narrow circle, but uh, but I can estimate this narrow circle as uh, uh, two, three, five hundred people. It's not so actually bad for poetry, for example. <laughs> and uh, those those people were not uh, forced by anybody. They they did it just by themselves. They uh, uh, typewritten or type wrote or wrote by hand. Sometimes it's also also normal at the time. Uh, so I believe it's not so bad actually. Uh, I understand that of course you cannot you cannot produce novels in this way, and this may be the the difference. Mm -hmm. For poetry and short stories, it's okay. It can be it can function without any publishing. <laughs> if if it's interesting enough, it can it can exist like you know like in ancient Greece. But novels, of course, it's it's a problem. First of all, uh, the writer cannot afford to to write for a long time without uh, any remuneration. And secondly, of course, it cannot be distributed, can, can circulate by in handwritten copies or typewritten copies. It's maybe today, we, when we have uh, internet and, and uh, Xeroxes, it may be easier, but uh, 
30 or 40 years ago, it was different. Yeah. But there is no official censor here. Are corporate pra publishers practicing a form of censorship? Isn't that a gross exaggeration? Uh, well, actually, I don't know, because we don't have something like corporate publishing. You know, in my country, it's still not very profitable business. And all, all publishing houses are small and independent. So maybe in this, in this terms, we are squared by you know, this ugly capitalism. I don't know. <laughs> Do you think there's any justification for people like Dale Pack and Mr. <coughs> Fit Mayhem and some angry writers for claiming that someone like me who simply wants to edit a manuscript to make it better and to make it perhaps more attractive to a larger audience. I mean, how can that, can, would, would that qualify as a form of censorship in your opinion as somebody who, who really knows what they're talking about, unlike some of the writers <laughs> that I have to deal with? Uh, is, is that an exaggeration or it depends? I actually don't know. Don't know, <laughs> don't know? Good to say. Okay. So that's good to hear. Um, <laughs> Carmen, you edited a very successful book of love poems, and you said it could never be published in this country. Why not? Uh, well, that's it's an anthology I did, and some of them are translated into Spanish. It's not something to be translated into English. So that's a book that has only a local circulation for Mexico. I made it for teenagers. It had a target. Uh, no, I mean, it has sold a lot because it's, uh, it, it, it became very attractive. And I did have to do a lot of work with the editor to convince him the book was going to sell. And it sold 160,000 copies, which is a lot. Um, but uh, it's not, it, it, can't, it, it's, it has no use in the United States it, because things have been translated into Spanish and it's, it was not just, it's a local product. And I hope it continues being so. Though I would love to continue changing it and the editor prefers to print only the same, it's cheaper. And well, you've also movie. said that the sensibility in this country is, is very different uh, and have implied that perhaps their tastes are less sophisticated or that publishers <laughs> like me are not very imaginative. Is that something you're not perhaps willing to say in public? Uh, no, no. <laughs> what I, no I, think, I think that, uh, I do think that taste changes. That's one thing. And another thing is, um, uh, I, I did all my career in Mexico, so I, I'm kind of a guarantee for people like you even. Um, I publish with an independent publisher, a beautiful literary house, Iruela, that you know, and then Random House takes it and makes reprints, uh, and the, the ones I published at Vuelta, that was also a very selective publishing house, was they have pocket books edition, uh, but they take me partially because people know who am I. And uh, here, I, I, I know I, I didn't make my career here, so uh, I, 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 and I, that's one part. And the other thing is, I do think the taste is very different. The literary reader of Latin America and Spain, especially Latin America, has a very cosmopolitan taste. Uh, is very uh, daring. Uh, now that I'm, I'm jury of an important prize of novel in Latin America, Romulo Gallegos is the most important prize. They've sent me a lot of books to read, and it's such a pleasure to see the variety and the diversity of uh, the Latin American and some uh, Spanish authors, especially Latin American, and they respond obviously to readers, because if you don't have readers at all, you don't have a, an editor, a publisher, or you cannot continue doing books. And the, the variety is uh, enormous. Most of them won't ever appear in the United States. Uh, first, because uh, this, this, that's the capital of publishing in New York, is very self-centered and, I would say, provincial. But also because the taste is, <laughs> is different. Uh, I, I mean, the book I love most, I have read, well, I've read like five that I really adore, and they wouldn't pass the proof of is this going to sell or not? And there are books that have received a lot of attention, and they do have their circle of readers. Of course, the magnitude of the corporate publishers in Latin America is very different. The push of the independent publishers is enormous. They are very daring. And um, 
word spreads, uh, the, the word uh, uh, circulates very easily. We, in fact, all these novels I had heard about them, the ones I, I've been reading, the ones that I really liked. There is a literary taste that has very different tastes. And I think that's a, a, a little miracle uh, that comes out from still mar marginalities in Latin America. Younger writers than me say that Latin America doesn't exist, that Latin, America, Latin, American, uh, Latin American writers younger than me, that, uh, that all that talking about that region of the world is totally ridiculous, that we have no different uh, identity. I think that the proof is in the novel. The novels are prodigious and, and different and, and so, I would even use the word insurgent. I mean, they are like a little revolution. I enter the book reading it like saying, wow! And they come with mm, daring pre proposals of narration and you have to be very active and trying to figure out and find it and enjoy it and have pleasure because reading is a an immense pleasure. Sorry. Can I say one thing, corporate overlord, about this? If you agree with me. <laughs> I won't know until I get to the end of this. But I, but I was going to say that we're talking a lot because we're all authors about the present and the future, uh, novels that we're writing or people that are publishing that we know. But I think there's a more complicated relationship even if you look at the, the past. And I think that if, if everybody here makes made a list, like uh, at the beginning of the session of the five books that you love. Most of those books have very complicated publishing histories from the past. Some of them started with a bigger publisher and were kept alive by smaller publishers. Mm -hmm. Some of them started with a small publisher. They sold healthily. A bigger publisher saw some self-interest in publishing them and picked them up. And, and I think that there's a kind of um, symbiotic, maybe destructive ultimately, relationship between these things to some degree for the past. Now this doesn't necessarily help or solve any of our issues. But I just know when I go home and I look on the shelf, and I don't do this because I just think of them as books. I don't, even though I'm, I'm a professional writer and I publish with houses, I don't really look at the little colophon. When I'm looking at my books, I don't see who published it. I just look at the book and I open it and I look at the words in it. But if I were to do that and I were to make a list of all the books in their publishing history, I'm fairly certain that they all wind through these channels where they were uh, multiply distributed or they were started in one part of the publishing industry and sustained by another part of the publishing industry. So I think I probably disagree with you a little bit, but I, I'm, I think you're important, but you as a corporate publisher are being used, and that's good for everybody else. You're being used as part of the process, which is fine because you are then compensated and you think you're not being used, but you are. <laughs> so I think it works out in some way okay. I, I'd also like to speak to that if I could. Um, I, I guess we're just revolutionarily seizing control here. <laughs> Seize it. Uh, You're I, on I, microphone. I, 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 I think I'm inclined to agree with you uh, on the one hand, but I also wonder if that's still possible anymore. You know, when I started publishing uh, in, you know, I sold my first book in, I think, 1992. It came out in 93, and it's almost 20 years later. When, when I moved to New York City, there were literally dozens and dozens of sort of major independent publishers mm -hmm. like William Morrow, like Ferrar, Strauss, and Giroux, and all that. Now all those companies have made, merged into basically six corporate entities. And although, of course, there are still, you know, many, you know, wonderful but very, very, very small independent houses. I mean, it, it sort of depends on, on, on how you defi define it. I think once upon a time we thought that a company like Ferrars, Strauss, and Giroux, which was publishing Scott Giroux and, mm -hmm. and, and Tom Wolfe, you know, major bestsellers, um, was still an independent publishing company. Now when you say independent publishing company, I, I, you're, you're talking about a company like the Feminist Press, which is, you know, not making, you know, tens of millions of dollars a year, um, uh, you know, off of its books, not regularly placing books onto um, the Times bestseller list. And so uh, how often do you think any more that, you know, a Virginia Woolf who publishes a book with the Hogarth Press, which she starts with her husband, um, uh, is, is going to end up you know, um, uh, being reprinted forever by Harcourt Grace Jovanovich, whatever it's part that's of that. That's right. I mean, you know, at, at this point, is is that still possible? Well, it it it. Who knows? I mean, we can't. I I I bristle at the idea that somehow, if corporate America isn't supporting artists, that those artists are being censored. I mean, I don't think that's true. Um, I don't think that's the right use of the word censored. And you know, there's there's this deeper problem with this culture that doesn't support its writers 
but and that support certainly isn't going to come from corporations whose mission it is always to get bigger and make more money. So, you know, I think that that writers that writers, you know, may, you know, writers, you know, it, you know, are always on some level on the outside. Artists are always on the outside of of uh, dominant culture and are somehow contributing something that that may become, you know, the only thing left of that culture. But to expect um, corporate America to recognize that and pay for it, I think, is delusional. And you know, we you know hope that there are these other these other means that will be meaningful in the future, but either way. You know, there is one more aspect to it, I think. And it's the, lit the literary agents, you know. Uh, because the literary agents, they live off you, right? And so they, uh, they really push you to be with, with you guys and uh, with the corporat corporative uh, the publishers uh, because they need money, right? And it's not only in like in one country because, for example, like um, for for example, I had an agent, an American agent. He only always tried the uh, you know people like you, okay, the corporate uh, publishers, um, because and I told him why don't why don't you go to smaller presses if some you know with some book it might be difficult or something. And he says, no, because then it won't sell in the rest of the world. Because the other publishers, like in Europe, for example, they would think, Who, who's your publisher in the States? Is it a big one or a small one? A small one, well, it doesn't really count, you know. A big one, OK, sure, let's think about it. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> <laughs> um, You've each, or some of you, have brought with you work that, uh, despite Amy's very wise analysis of the situation, that you claim was suppressed or, or censored or, or something. I, I, it's very strange to me, and I don't really understand. But perhaps you could read very briefly, um, since I don't really find writing all that interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Think you are, some of you are blaming the. Uh, I've never had a real editor that cuts any of my books or has taken out one word of the books. They, they, I give them the manuscript and they just do uh, basic uh, typo corrections and the figure of the editor doesn't really exist in, in, in Mexico nor in Spain. The editor, like the American one that puts the hands on, on the book, so I've never had that. And I think I've become more daring in certain things myself. I, dare I have a column in a newspaper and I t talk of whatever I want. I mean, whatever I want. They never, ever have told me, don't talk about this. I can say whatever I want of whoever I want, and, and they don't even fact check. I say <laughs> what I want. Um, but what has happened is that I have become more timid with my private life. I, now I do my fictions, building them in, in, a, in a scenery that has nothing to do with me or that is so far away and distance. And I enjoy that distance to work with the, the characters, the situations, everything. Uh, but my first novel, uh, I, I wrote it about something that was very intimate and very, my, my mother died when I was a kid and I had a stepmother. And I didn't like the stepmother, as normally happens. And then I was a stepmother myself. But <laughs> <laughs> and I did everything I could to seduce the kid for good. I think I could. Um, but uh, I, I, I wrote a book that I, I, don't, I wouldn't dare. I won't say publish. I would say write today, because I knew it would hurt. In this case, my father and the children of my stepmother and my brothers and sisters and everybody. And I didn't, I didn't measure that. I wrote my novel. Then I hid it eight years in a drawer because I already had some respectability as a poet. And I, didn't, I knew that if you are a poet and also a novelist, you lose bonuses in poetry land. So I decided I was going to keep up being a poet. But then I wrote my second novel. And when I finished it, I said, no, I have to publish it first. 
and then I published it immediately the second one. Um, but in that first novel, I, 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 I dare say something's quite horrible. Like uh, this is one fragment of it. Any sane person could pick that up of the sidewalk and then throw it away again after a few yards or before getting on the bus without it being anything unusual. Or in a more extreme situation, perhaps hold on to it, but put it in a box, keep it in a closet and think, what a mad idea. But father's situation goes beyond anything of the kind. He took that up, brought it home, showed it <coughs> to all of us, and everything afterwards happened as a consequence. We were too many and too innocent to understand that not just it, but all of us were to become the elements of our terrible shame. And so we played our parts perfectly. I remember a number of incidents, anecdotes, and situations from before it came. But the vividness of the images I can recall means nothing. They no longer belong to us. The first indication was like that. No one knows who left the dog loose in the backyard, but whoever did so knew he would finish off the pigeons. One was left alive, but it was so torn up that father had it killed, and he would never face up to it with us. He pretended to have nothing to do with the sudden change or with the presence of that. One day, in a fit of pique, I tried to get rid of it. Fighting back my disgust, I picked it up between two pieces of steel cardboard and went to throw it out of the house. As I did so, father came up to me and grabbed my arm, sending it to the floor. And then he took after me for something else. The untidiness of my room, I think. He never said, it is mine, or anything at all, admitting to the ownership it, though the ownership it was foolish to try to hide, etc. All the novel is uh, an attack of rage against a person who, unluckily, was my stepmother, and I called her "eat that." <laughs> <laughs> I uh, honestly, I mean, I I wouldn't dare now. So I have switched my fiction into things that are that don't hurt my dearest ones nearby. Ben, uh, I um, I also have had no interest in writing about. It was very painful for me to write about myself. Uh, so I, through my, most of my writing, have taken the opportunity to sort of write. I guess they were called experimental pieces originally. And the first book I wrote was called Superbad in 2001. And I do have a sort of censorship story, which was that I took it around to publishers. And it was, in my mind, a, a book that collected humor pieces and serious literary stories. All the corporate publishers, the bigger publishers, said, we'll do either one or the other. We'll make you a, a writer of serious short fiction or will make you a humor writer, but both is crazy. We're not going to put both into one book, which didn't make sense to me because most of the people that I know are funny and sad in the same day. <laughs> so uh, eventually McSweeney's uh, published it just as is. They, they decided they wanted to publish a book that had you know, a 300-word humor piece next to a 12,000-word serious story, next to an 800-word humor piece, next to a 10,000-word short story. Skip ahead 10 years, and this, the first book that I did for HarperCollins was a very serious, somewhat sad book of short stories about uh, people failing to communicate effectively with each other when they were or weren't in love, and about letter writing, and very sort of stately and literary in all the traditional literary ways. Second book, I'd written, uh, I think, four books in four years, and I wanted to just stop. It was too much. So I had this idea that, to me, was a comedy idea, a joke idea. And I was having lunch with my editor at HarperCollins, and I mentioned it, and he sees that, and he said, that should be the next book. And it seemed insane to me. I thought he had lost his mind or had been poisoned. I didn't know what happened. So the idea was to take uh, Chekhov stories uh, and take out the characters and put in contemporary celebrities in place of the original characters and reupholster them somewhat. And I thought it would be good for maybe one or two pieces placed somewhere. He thought it was a whole book. And he actually convinced me, and I, and I thought it was such a strange reversal Maybe this is your, you're lulling me, you corporate people are lulling me into security. But I didn't see sort of the sales end of it. I didn't see the, the justification. And I thought when he agreed to do this, or he encouraged me to do it, that I would be the most, within the realm of that idea, the most subversive 
possible. So I, this, this was self-censored. Uh, there's a story called The Classical Student about a young student who uh, he comes home, he's despondent, he's failed an exam, and then he encounters his mother and then a boarder in their boarding house. And I change it, and I have Lindsay Lohan as the young student, and she's failed an audition. And the boarder in the house is Stephen Colbert, the famous television host. And I'll just read a little piece of this and then tell you what happened with it. So he, she comes home, she's failed the audition, her mother's despondent, angry at her, tells Stephen Colbert, he yells at her all about how she should be better prepared, and then this happens. When he had finished his speech, he took off his belt and took Lindsay by the hand. It's the only way to deal with you, he said. Lindsay knelt down submissively and thrust her head between the house guest's knees. Her prominent pink ears moved up and down against his new trousers, which had brown stripes on the outer seams. Lindsay did not utter a single word. At the family council in the evening, it was decided to send her into business. So that, that's the end of the real Chekhov story. And, and they, um, so I wrote this to Stephen Colbert. And then as we got closer to the deadline, I was calculating not only offending famous people, which I thought would have been nice in some ways, um, but who was famous. It was an odd sort of moment when certain, this was a year ago, a year and a half ago, certain celebrities rose, others were falling. And I ended up changing this. I changed it away from Stephen Colbert toward, toward this gentleman, uh, Jesse James, who was cheating on Sandra Bullock at the time. Not so famous now. Very famous a year and a half ago. Uh, I changed it. Then when we were sending out first serial for the book, I accidentally sent this version, and it was published in a magazine. And it was an interesting process, because I ha this, I think, is better. I made the error of changing it to the other less famous guy, because I thought he would be more famous, and maybe he would be more angry. Uh, through this process, there was deafening silence from the publisher. I think that they, for whatever reason, I think they were largely wrong, but they thought this idea would revolutionize it. You know, they, I think they thought that it was similar to that um, Pride and Prejudice and Zombies thing, which it isn't. Very different idea. And they thought it would catch on in the same way, and it didn't. And it was very interesting to watch. I think, I think they were supportive, but that was an example where I, I self-censored. I, I, I was not sure... Not so much that I was afraid of him, but I was trying to calculate the level of affront. And I think I, I miscalculated that. So we only, I apologize. We only have about 10 minutes <clears throat> left. Um, do you guys have a passage that well, you'd like to uh, you'd like to bring forth? Well, maybe not, not today, not now. Uh, I'm, I'm not uh, lucky enough to have some problems with censorship uh, in today's Ukraine. Uh, on the contrary, I have the opposite problem. They seem to publish everything uh, without reading, without. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I can I can uh, tell uh, two very very short stories uh, from the communist time, which are I believe uh, very funny. They were not funny at the time, but today they look look uh, anecdotal. Uh, one happened. Uh, one story happened to me. It was uh, my article about some Slovak, uh, ca uh, cult Slovak classical poet from Slovakia, Andrei Plavka. And there was a sentence. You never guess what was uh, correct. It was, was censored there. There was a sentence about this poet that uh, in his early years, uh, for his development, his uh, artistic development, uh, lessons of national culture, national uh, folklore, national tradition were very important. Guess what was corrected there? The word national. It was it was replaced by the word Slovak uh, culture, <laughs> Slovak folklore, Slovak <coughs> tradition. Why? Because in Ukraine context, the very the very word national was very dangerous. It referred to something like you know nationalism and so on. It, and it was that scene in the Soviet Union. Uh, the second story uh, comes from uh, my friend who uh, decided to, uh, to publish something uh, and produce uh, rather secure. Uh, novel about for children for teenagers, and one of the episode uh, episodes was in uh, in the submarine, and he described the submarine all these devices uh, inside, and uh, this uh, episode was uh, crossed off by official censors. Uh, there was no censorship in the Soviet Union. There was a state committee to protect uh, state secrets in press, and it was crossed all this all this description of submarine was crossed off. Off. And the author claims that, well, I, I never I never been to submarine. I have no idea about submarine. <laughs> but he described some some you know some uh, some devices like you know like let's say uh, crab matter. I don't I don't remember the precise name, but uh, fictional. 
And he argues that it doesn't exist at all. But no, nonetheless, it was crossed off, and uh, they didn't care. So crap matter did not appear to, to uh, CIA. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a couple I can actually uh, it, it recite. The, the, the one passage that was actually ever actually struck from a book was five words, and the words were, though she wasn't a lesbian. Um, and uh, they referred to Susan Sontag. Um, uh, the character had been described as looking like Susan Sontag at combat, though she was not less real. Um, and I had included the passage um, in part because uh, I was a huge fan of Susan Sontag's writing. Um, and I just happened to be, be published by Farah Strauss and Giroux, which is Susan Sontag's publisher. And they purchased the book, and uh, I, I actually asked them about this immediately because Susan was very well known for not liking to talk about her sexuality in public. She was also very well known as a lesbian, lived for many, many, many years with Annie Leibovitz, and and you know there was no particular secret about this. And I was initially told that everything would be fine, and then when the book actually reached galleys or was about to go into galleys, uh, my editor handed me the manuscript with the red line through it, um, and uh, and and basically told me that it was, you know, we cut the line or the book would not be published. Um, and the reason that he gave for that, uh, essentially, was that his job was on the line. Um, so I agreed, um, uh, thinking at the time that it wasn't such a big deal because it wasn't about the character at all, although, um, you know, I mean, the character wasn't actually a lesbian, and, and it, w it was a minor little point, but it, it became very ominous to me afterwards, this idea that you couldn't mention that someone is a lesbian, even though she's a lesbian, without adding anything else about that. And so I began to talk about it in interviews and stuff, because I was <laughs> asked all the time, as a young, you know, gay novelist, um, uh, at a moment when gay novel, when gay fiction was just starting to go mainstream, whether I had to change anything in order to get my book published by a house like FSG. And I said, yes, I had to cut the line, though she wasn't a lesbian. Um, and I was told um, at a certain point when this got back to FSG that if I continued to talk about this, my book contract for my next book would be canceled. Um, so, so uh, I, I mean, you know, it's it's not quite the same thing as you know what what someone is experiencing, um, uh, you know, in in the Ukraine or you know or in the Ukraine under the Soviet Union. Um, uh, but you know, it, it is it is fairly ominous. And the other example is actually just from a couple of years ago. I wrote a young adult book um, called Sprout. Um, uh, and the main character, Sprout, is a budding writer. And um, at one point, there was a little footnote. Um, uh, he makes a joke about why he's not capitalizing the word frisbee or touchstone um, or a few other words. He's you know, um, basically saying that you know, words that have passed into common language should no longer be owned by corporations. I was not allowed to print this, this, this publication <laughs> because I was advocating copyright violation. And it was very interesting to me as I had a conversation with, with the company's lawyer who told me that it was perfectly okay for me to advocate murder, to advocate racism, to advocate rape, to advocate you know, revolution against you know, the, the government, but I could not advocate violation of copyright because the company would be sued and the book would not be published. And so. we're gonna have to end our conversation there. Thank you so much for coming.